All right. Hello and welcome. Good evening. To uh, welcome to the Texas Hill Country Advisors podcast, where we discuss financial education, the stock market, the economy, and how they may apply to you. Uh, it is Monday, March the seventh, twenty twenty-two. I believe it's March seventh. Did I get that? Right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Good. Good. <laughs> uh, just after six p.m., we're in Kerrville, Texas, and we are streaming from our usual location here at Pint and Plow. Uh, I am your host, Andrew Gay, along with my business partner, Gilbert Pies. Hello, Gilbert. Hello, Andrew. Hello, hello. Yeah, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately for those of y'all following us today, you get a double dose of Gilbert and myself today if you're following <laughs> the lead. So, um, that sounds kind of scary. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad yeah. thing. Pardon me real quick. Let me share our, our, uh, our post here. Um, we, uh, we have a... a packed show for you guys tonight we have plenty to talk about um, we're excited to talk about it there's a lot happening out there we just are coming off the week uh, last week here locally we had the economic summit um, which was awesome Gilbert and I got to attend that last week um, I enjoyed it did you enjoy it absolutely yeah, yeah. We, we got to go with uh, several customers and it was uh, good to hear about the economic happenings in the hill country yeah, and um, you know, there. I think it's I think it's such an awesome opportunity because the last couple of years that they've had it, or when when we've gone, they've always invited an economist, which is like that's so awesome. It's like right here in our backyard, we get to go there, and the guy I um, I, I can't remember his last name. It's Luis something, but he was he was extremely informative and insightful, and had a lot of good stuff to say about the economy, not just here locally. I thought it was really interesting, too, because they tie it back to Texas, right. you know, and it's like local, but... Um, Lu yeah. Luis uh, Torres, what, right? Wasn't it Luis Torres? He's from Texas A&M? Yeah, actually, yes, that, that sounds right. I, I know it sounds weird that uh, Aggie would know anything about economics, but... <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> he, yeah. he, he actually had some pretty good information. Yeah, he did. And, he and did. for guys like you and me, we the dig numbers, um, you know, that... That's that's like having I don't know the Rolling Stones playing or something I don't know. No, it is. You're right. It's it's right. We've already, we've talked about that before. How excited we get to talk about market stuff, which yeah. I don't think uh, most people uh, get as, as worked up as we do over that. So <laughs> anyway, um, but that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. So yes. um, we we have some some data coming out in the next weeks, couple weeks uh, that we've been waiting on since basically the end of January. Um, it's kind of a big deal. A lot of it has to do with inflation and all that. So let me let me read through our necessary disclosure here, and then we're going to get to it. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Next Financial Group, member Finra Sipic. Texas Hill Country Advisors is not an affiliate of Next Financial Group. This material is not intended as an offer or solicitation. For the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instruments, past performance does not guarantee future performance. All the views expressed are those of Andrew Gay and Gilbert Pies and Texas Hill Country Advisors and not those of Next Financial Group. The S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index composed of common stocks of the 500 leading companies and leading industries in the U.S. economy and the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average is a price weighted index of 30 actively traded blue chip stocks. All right. So um, speaking of those two indexes, let's let's take a look at how they ended the week last week. Um, I know that they, they did not have a good day today either. Um, so once again, we got we got some some down numbers to report, but nevertheless, we're going to go right through it. Yes. Uh, Dow closed last Friday at thirty three thousand six hundred fifteen, which is around about performance number year to date of negative seven point two percent. Um, and that's down from the 6% where it was at the Friday before. The S&P closed at 4,329, which is about a negative 8.9% uh, performance number year to date for the S&P, which is also down from the negative 7.8% where it was at the Friday before. And the NASDAQ closed at 13,313, which is a year to date performance number of negative 14.8%, which is down from negative 12.4% where it was at the Friday before. So, um, you know, we finished off February last week. Um, we're in March now, and, and we're still kind of trending down. And interestingly enough, and Gilbert and I have talked about this till we're blue in the face, I think, but, you know, the pressures that we've seen in the market, um, you know, it's not been the same catalyst necessarily this entire time. We've seen uh, interest rate narrative take hold in the first, uh, you know, month, six weeks of the year, right? And the markets were reacting to that, and we got volatility out of that. But now it's all about the geopolitical stuff happening across the pond. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, I was uh, on the way over here. I got in my truck and I was driving over here and 
the the funniest song came on the radio. It was uh, the Bee Gees, "Staying Alive," <laughs> and this is the kind of the this is the kind of market where you just want to stay alive to fight again the next day. And you know, over the past several weeks, the you know since the beginning of the year, it's been it's been tough. People people have been looking around, saying, you know, what is going on, and what should I do? Right. And uh, the the best advice you can give somebody right now, and we can talk a little more about specific ideas um, well maybe not too specific but some general ideas uh, yeah. but but right now um, the the overall advice is just stay alive stay alive to fight another day and um, you know that BG song I started laughing when it came on I, I, was, I, I thought it was hilarious I said well I got to be sure to mention that because this is the kind of market where you just you just want to stay alive to right. fight another day that is the song that's like uh. <laughs> Staying alive. Yeah, I'm not right? going okay. to attempt right. to sing it, but yeah, you, well, know, you, you um, know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You, you got anyway, the you okay. got the uh, beat down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, all it. right. All right. All right. Just just making sure. Just <laughs> just checking. Um, yeah, that's a good point, man. I think um, you know we kind of talked about that last week too. Was um, sometimes the best course. Sometimes, depending on your situation, sometimes the best course of action is to do nothing. Right. 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 And just just live to fight another day. That's sometimes all you can ask for. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah too, too bad we can't you better not sing too much of it we might get banned you yeah know? i know we or, had that problem one time or, or uh our viewership just goes down goes, goes to away zero. yeah yeah um, <laughs> yeah uh okay so to finish up our market recap we got the vix uh closed above 30 last friday at around 32 the last several weeks we've been reporting on that it was below 30 it was flirty it, it spiked uh i think you know, like our last podcast, the the week before it, it spiked above 30, but closed Friday below 30. So all that means is there's a lot of volatility going on out there uh, right now. Um, and, you know, it's showing up in the headlines. I'm sure you guys are, are, are getting doses of it in your in your inboxes and your um, notifications. So uh, never mind that your wallet. That's where <laughs> All right, we're that's going where there. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. We're, yeah, getting, we're, there. we're getting there, too. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, about. The, OK, so oil closed at 115. Uh, this is the first time I think we're reporting on um, oil uh, closing above $100 a barrel. Yes. Uh, we've t been talking about that. Gilbert's been saying $100 a barrel, here we come, and then we're there. So we closed last Friday above, <laughs> significantly above 100 too. And, so. and I also said uh, $4 a gallon gas is coming too, and that's not too far off. My wife called me this afternoon, and she said, do you know how much gas is at HEB? And that typically is the cheapest place in town Here. 369 i think she said and um i know there's one one filling station here in town that was 399 i was about morning. to say i, I just said, saw this afternoon i saw 389 yeah. right down the road yeah i saw 399 um this was probably saturday or sunday that i saw it yeah uh, which you know it's not that far off from four bucks i'm sad to say it was you're right. It's not. It's one cent off. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I, t I, I hate. I hate that I was right about that, but unfortunately, yeah. It, it and it might be here for a little while. Yeah, I hate that you were right about that too. Um, but you're gonna fill it in your pocketbook. We're gonna. We're probably. We might circle back to that one. Um, yes. So ten year. Uh, last but not least, uh, ten year U.S. Treasury closed around one point seven two last Friday, or one point seven two percent last Friday. Um, that is the yield that we follow on the 10 year, uh, us treasury. And the last time we did the podcast, it was about 197. So it actually came down a lot of that. Like we've talked about previously was because of a flight to safety that you saw in the markets, some of the air coming out of maybe the equity markets or other, other pockets of the markets and flowing into the fixed income market because of geopolitical concerns. And just, they call that a risk off tone, yes. right? And yes. that correct how they refer to that. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, they got a bunch of names for, for it, but that's one of them. For weeks, that 10 year treasury yield was just moving steadily towards 2%. And, and with, it crossed it. Yeah, yeah, it sure did. It didn't stay there very long because everybody's freaking out about Russia, Ukraine, and all of a sudden you started seeing money flow back to U.S. treasuries, which are considered the safest security that you can get other than cash, I suppose. And so yeah. uh, you started to see that yield come down because the prices started going up on those things. Everybody was well. We, you had tons of money going that direction. So, right. Um, that that's so, what's so it drives the, the price. Off. Yeah, it drives right. the price of the the security or the fixed income instrument right. up, which drives the yield or the amount that it's um, paying you, down. Yeah, right. yeah, I don't think I have a good alternative word for yield. <laughs> um, yeah, very so specific. Um, 
but yes, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, I think, I don't know, uh, let's use that as a segue to talk about interest rates because um, that's that's a hot topic right now, and we got some data coming out. We get a CPI number uh, this Thursday, this Thursday morning at 8.30 hour time, I believe, um, and then next week we have Jerome Powell actually speaking um, and coming out with the federal rate uh federal reserve rate decision um after their two-day meeting which ends on wednesday i think so right, right. T- tell people what the cpi is for the people that don't know yeah so and actually i got a pretty little picture here to show everyone let's see let's bring this thing up here all right so uh this is a list of economic data just for the u.s that is coming out this week so you know um I love looking at this because you're like, oh, yeah, there's all this stuff happening. You don't hear about hardly any of it. The ones in red right here that were highlighted, this is what we're looking at. So right here, here's the magic. Here's the magic number. This is the much anticipated number waiting on. So the previous number, which was from January to January, year over year inflation number was 7.5 percent. And that's the that is the CPI, which is um, the consumer price index. This year over so they'll measure year over year again from february to february and the expected uh is 7.9 so i actually heard 7.8 this morning but man that's hot it is it is hot hot. so where it's it's significantly above uh what used to be known as like the two percent two to three percent average inflation target that the fed was kind of aiming for right yeah for, for years inflation was basically non-existent the feds were trying everything they could to stimulate the economy, and um, it wasn't working. But there's there's not a whole lot of need to stimulate the economy now. They already they already did the stimulating last year, right? Pro- yeah, prices have gone up substantially, um, and it's not just oil prices. You have uh, groceries costing a lot more money, um, right. But but all of that's part of inflation. Um, wage increases, huge demand for employees, but. I think yeah. I think a lot of that stuff is going to cool off pretty quick. That uh, big increase in oil prices is really going to drive people to say, "Hey, look, I, I need to cut back on something," and you'll you'll start seeing consumer there, spending drop on other sectors. Yeah, because they'll either cut back on the spending or they'll spend it in different areas, right? Right. Um, what's 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 the thing we always say? What's the cure? For high prices? High prices. That's the cure. That's the best cure for high prices is Cause, high prices. Because eventually you'll get to a point where, right, economics class 101, you get to that, that point where it doesn't work anymore. And, and it's it's not just I'll just pay the price. It's, okay, this price is high enough that I'm going to look for either a substitute or I'm going to reallocate my budget. Yes. At the pump, M- Most people recognize what, what they pay for the at the pump. And as soon as you get enough of those cycles going through – it really becomes painful, and, and for a lot of people, it's a really, really big deal. For some people, it's it's a minor inconvenience, but for the average person like you and me, hey, you know, f- paying $4 a gallon for gas all of a sudden gets your attention. Yeah. And um, It's a really large variable. What I see is oil prices are going to keep moving up. That means gas prices are going You're going to start seeing people all of a sudden pull back. They're spending in other areas. Now, how how serious or how severe is it going to be? I don't know, but it, it'll it'll be pretty quick, I think, and it'll take some time for that to be reflected in the PI numbers and right. inflation and what have you. But it'll happen. It'll happen pretty quick, and um, the longer this lasts, the uh, the tougher it can become. Yeah. Well, um, we're gonna we'll we'll see about uh, February's year over year number come thursday so we'll get that number and you know if it's above expectations remember the expectation is nearly half a percentage point higher than it was from last month's year over year reading from january um you know the other thing i just make a point real quick about something you mentioned because we're talking about if the price of gas let's say at the pump gets too high i'm going to start reallocating my spending in other areas or possibly it's it's probably kind of hard to find a substitute um, for gasoline, but uh, the the point is, and I thought this is interesting too, because the headline inflation, and even the guy that was speaking at the economic summit last week was quoting CPI, and that tends to be 
what most people like to quote is CPI is the consumer price index index, but the Federal Reserve favors PCE, which is personal consumer cons, uh, consumer expenditures, right? Right. Which includes substitutes. Um, and that number actually has been, uh, I think the year over year January number for that one was 6.1 versus the 7.5. Okay, so it's still really high. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I found that interesting um, right, that right. we're so obsessed with CPI, but yet that's not even the favored indicator that the Federal Reserve uses to make their decisions. Now, a lot of times they're probably going to be trending in the right in the same direction, and there might not be that much divergence there. But nevertheless, it's still different. Sure, it's sure. not the same thing. Well, and when you when you mention substitutes, um, <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, my wife was uh, laughing the other day. We were joking about it, and we were saying, well. I'll tell you what the substitute is for driving your vehicle. It's called the uh, batamobile, which is, you know, bata in Spanish is feet. So, sure, sure. So you, you're going to start walking. People will start walking, or they'll look for alternatives like uh, Bicycle, motorcycles, uh, mass transportation, uh, scooters, EVs, you know, electric sure. vehicles, things yeah. like that. And um, th there's some people, some conspiracy theorists that would tell you that um, – some of this higher oil prices business is engineered to push us more in a clean energy direction. That's um, a that's the most tinfoil thing I've heard <laughs> all day today. That is great. Well, well, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna bash on on hey, that because that unless it, you can disprove it. One of one of uh, my customers who I spoke to today said she heard the vice president say that that it was uh, um, maybe a good reason to consider alternatives to. Sure. Uh, internal combustion engine. Um, so yeah. I, I didn't hear it. I mean, I'm just repeating what one of my customers sure, said sure, she heard. Sure. But uh, Well, and at the same time, Elon Musk just came out the other day and said something about, you know, we need we need to we need more access to oil. Oh, right. And, and, and even though it said, would hurt even, even though it would hurt his main company. Uh, right. Right. And and he even said uh, nuclear. He, he thought nuclear energy was a uh, good alternative also. Um, yeah. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there, there's probably a middle ground in there somewhere. Well, I just heard today they're talking about restarting or trying to restart the a lot of the nuclear power plants in Europe. Yes. Right? Or at least throwing around the idea of trying to do that. I don't know how. I don't know how plausible that would be. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know. Um, okay, here, jump back real quick before I get off this trading uh, economics website, which is where where we're at here with this uh, info. So. Once again, this is the number we're going to get Thursday morning at 7.30 hour time. Expectation is 7.9% for the CPI um, year over year, February to February. So uh, we'll get that one Thursday morning. So we'll definitely be talking about that next week um, in the market reaction. And the one other thing I wanted to show, and we will definitely talk about this next week too, but um, right here. So this is this is the same list of data, essentially whatever's happening in the U.S. economically, except you can see right here. There is lots happening. This is Wednesday, March 16th. So this is the second day that is concluding the Federal Reserve's meeting, and they will come out with the interest rate decision. It's right here. Um, and here is the, expect the expectation. It's not worth paying attention to on here because they haven't raised rates in so long. That's part of what's happening right now. <laughs> so uh, the expectation is that they're going to raise 0.25%. And if you are curious where that comes from, here is this lovely chart that, look, I thought this was cool. They even have like a uh, countdown in the top right. You see that? Eight days, <laughs> <laughs> eight days, 18 hours, 39 minutes, and 43 seconds, but who's counting? All right, so this is a C, This is from the CME group. Uh, this is a FedWatch tool. We've referenced this before. We didn't pull it up last Monday, but basically this – the, the thought, uh, this is trying to measure the market's expectation of what they think the Federal Reserve is going to do with interest rates. And if you look up in the top left, it tells you the next meeting. So this next meeting is March 16th, the one that I just referenced. They think this is saying there is a 94.9% chance, 94 .9 chance of a hike, and we think that it's going to land between 25 and 50 basis points. Or what you would see in the headline, if you're reading about this, is probably a 25.25 or a quarter percent rate hike. So that's what this is. If you've been watching the show, you know that the last several weeks we watched this when we got the last CPI number from January, you know that we were watching this exact same tool and the whole thing swung from a 0.25 or a quarter percent point expectation of hiking to half a percentage point and then back. So it went there and back and then 
and then the Ukraine Russia stuff kicked off, and now the market narrative has turned away from interest rates. But we're about to be focused back on it as of this week with the CPI, and then Powell speaking in the interest rate decision next week. So, and and more importantly, notice that uh, now that Fed Watch tool has a small chance of no interest rate hike at all, which yes. is pretty amazing because that that was not even there. And as you said a few weeks ago, there was a pretty hefty opinion that rates were going to go up by 50 basis points or more and now that's gone completely right uh, in interesting how things can change on depending on the news yeah thank you for saying that because i know we talked about that earlier but yeah so uh i think the entire time we've been using this picture this tool this fed watch tool and and showing it to you guys i think the entire time it was at up here in the top right it was at a hundred percent probability of the rate hike and that just means that the market is thinking that there's a hundred percent chance of a rate hike, but nevertheless, it was a hundred percent for like what, like two months or something. I mean, right. it was it didn't budge. This is the first time we've seen that move. So yeah, there's still the market still think there's like almost a ninety five percent chance that they're going to hike rates, and that sounds pretty sure. However, the ch the change in that there is a small percentage now uh, or school of thought, if you will, that maybe they won't do anything. Um, and that's honestly, we think, because of the geopolitical pressures that we're getting um, and the commodity pressure and all the stuff that's I, I don't gyrating even wanna, through the markets right now. I, I wouldn't even want to think about what would make that possibility even happen, the the chance of them not raising rates at all. Something I don't want to think about that either. They need really, to. Really, really, really bad would have to happen for them not to raise interest rates, even if right. it's just a little bit. Um, it, it's, a, it's a scary thought, but it's it's out there. It's a risk, you know, and that's the other thing, too. I thought I thought that was interesting that um, the gentleman that was speaking uh, last week at the economic summit kept mentioning raising interest rates too fast as a monetary policy error, which is just a fancy way of saying that they're, they messed up. They, they miscalculated or they're behind the curve. He kept saying they were behind, but the risk of them raising interest rates too fast is what could cause a recession. But it seems like there's a whole lot of other factors that are at play now that might not have been at play, you know, the last time that they were trying to raise rates back in 2015 when they started this again. Right. The right. balance sheet being one of them and the biggest one of the biggest ones. Yeah, he had a really interesting perspective on that. He said bull markets are not don't die of old age. They get killed. They get murdered. They get yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that was his word, yeah. murdered by uh a catalyst of some kind, right? Yeah, but, well, he said the the Fed. They get murdered by the Fed um, because they raise rates too high uh, or they raise them too quickly, and it chokes off the growth in the economy, and it causes a recession. Now, I, you know, I, I guess you could you could look at that from all kinds of different angles, but you had a good point the other day, too. You, you said just because there's a uh, correlation doesn't mean it's causation, right? I think it's Absolutely. You, That's yeah. like one of my favorite – yeah, Scenes. I mean, um, Beth hates it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, well, it. But you're right. I mean, just because one happens after the other doesn't mean that the first thing caused it. I mean, that's it right. Just means that they seem to happen in tandem. So uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think he might be right in that, um, you know, this bull rally or bull run that we've had in the market for the past 10 years, 10 plus years um, is pretty old. It's pretty yeah. old, but. Uh, Looks like the uh, the guy in the is is around the corner with a knife and he's gonna murder. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like you're just <laughs> the, waiting the, for the next shoe to drop. But you know? it, but it might not be the Fed this time. I don't know. Yeah, um, who knows? Well, let's uh, let's use that as like kind of a segue into what we wanted to expand on tonight, which is just monetary policy in general. And sure. I did just mention it, I think, for the first time. But it's a it's monetary policy. Uh, let's do this. I actually have the definition pulled up. I'm gonna show you guys. Uh, let's see. Let's do this. So this is Investopedia, which is one of my favorite websites, I think, that has ever existed. Um, <laughs> but let's see. Uh, do you know how nerdy that sounds when you say that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's pretty cool. I, I bet you we were 18 years, you know, saying Investopedia is your favorite website probably was not even close to being on the top of your mind. I see. All right. No, I know. Okay, so monetary policy. Let's get a little definition going on here. Um Non-standard monetary policy. They love to. Okay. Um, 
so we'll see if we can toggle between these two. So we're going to try to break down the, the Federal Reserve balance sheet and monetary policy. But monetary policy in general is just – it's in reference to what the Federal Reserve has to – uh, has to use to uh, levers, if you will, to influence the American economy, um, right? Mainly, mainly through watching economic indicators such as the employment, unemployment rate, right? Um, and so they so they track some of those indicators, but then they actually deploy uh, tools through quote unquote monetary policy to influence the. Uh, the local economy, the United States economy, which is um, influencing uh, uh, open market operations through on the short end of the yield curve, which just means that they can buy and sell securities in the open market for dealers, right? right. Um, so they do have a balance sheet of sorts, if you will, and then also actually setting the Federal Reserve uh, uh, interest rate, um, which is kind of the bottom interest rate, if you will, of most every other interest rate. Right. Yeah, because the the Federal Reserve is the bank for bankers. Right. And so they're it's the, the bank ones, of banks. There you go. The bank of banks. It's the biggest bank. Yes. Right. Yes. And so they they have a lot of influence on in what happens in the Fed funds rate. Of course, the number that we're always quoting, interest rate. Um, yeah. It, it's their. It's the rate that they pay banks for overnight deposits, right? Yes. They they lend. They essentially. So basically what happens behind the scenes every single night is banks lend each other uh, money only overnight at this extremely short-term rate, which is the federal funds rate um, is what we're talking about, because they are required to keep a certain amount of reserves on deposit, the banks, this is, on deposit at the Federal Reserve. And because of a bunch of banking transactions happens every single business day, right? Their amount of reserve requirements is going to be based on their total deposit book and, and whatever these other ratios are that change on a daily basis. So if they're short um, or over in one day overnight, right, they can – one bank that's over could lend the other bank that's under some this money at this overnight extremely, like, low interest rate, right? Right. And, um, the, and the Fed can manipulate that rate to influence deposits and flows of funds and what have you. So li liquidity, right, you know, right. um, you know how much money is out there flowing between the banks. So, um, okay, real quick, here's the actual definition. It took me a second to find it, but monetary policy refers to the actions of a central bank to influence a nation's monetary money supply. Sorry, money supply and economy. Monetary policy is used to influence the employment situation and to manage inflation. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. And a central bank is a country's bank that we're talking about in this case, because we live in the United States. It's the Federal Reserve. That is out. That is America's central bank. So yeah. and they've they've got two jobs: manage inflation and maximize employment. Right. They, those are the only two jobs they've got. They're they're not worried about the stock market. They're not worried about oil prices. They're not worried about anything else but managing inflation so and the, it's, in maximum the, employment. And those two things right now are kind of in the hot seat because yep. uh, the employment situation, we're, we have a lo we have sub 4%, I believe, yes. um, uh, unemployment rate, uh, which is considered good in the realm of good because I think it – I think it went up to like 14 or something. I mean, uh, it, uh, right, right at the beginning of COVID, yeah, right. it, it shot up COVID. dramatically. Um, but, yeah, so employment – uh, we have strong un unemployment numbers, and then inflation. I don't think we have to tell you all about the inflation situation. So, uh, yeah, they're under pressure right now. So that's why we're talking about this tonight. Right, right. and and they're supposed to be independent. So, um, they, independent, they, independent of who? The the political establishment. They're they're supposed to make independent ideas or decisions based on uh, politics free. So, the Congress gets to. Um, pass muster on who gets to sit on the Federal Reserve Board, but they just found here one more. The Federal Reserve is their little. That's definition. my man Jay right there. Young Young Powell, <laughs> man, Young Powell. Uh, the internet loves him, by the way. Um, there's plenty of J Powell memes out there. It's awesome. Uh, the Federal Reserve controls monetary policy, which is what we were just talking about in the U.S aiming to ensure a safe and stable financial system. And, and most countries have a central bank. Yeah, I was just about to say that because, um, you know, right when we entered the beginning of the year and all this talk was on uh, interest rates and inflation, 
before the geopolitical stuff that was happening, uh, we were hearing, we were getting bits about what other central banks were doing with their interest rates. Right. Um, you know, you have Christina Lagarde, and um, I think she's Germany Central Bank, maybe? Uh, um, the Australian Central Bank, uh, Can Canadian, they were just all in the news in the last couple of weeks, so. Yeah, and, um, and of course, all those other central banks, they they have their own policy makers, their own decision-making authority, their their own objectives that they're trying to fulfill. Right. And so you don't normally get all central banks operating jointly or in unison to, for one particular goal. Although here lately, um, because of the geopolitical situation, yeah. that's um, they, they've all been acting together uh, to uh, choke off our friends in Russia. Uh, um, they're going to squeeze them, squeeze them hard. The only problem is um, that squeezing isn't isn't uh, pain free to us. Yes, the law of unintended consequences. Amen. Right? amen. And, and there's, I think, there's a lot of stuff out there that we don't even know about how that's going to end up landing on our doorstep, um, so to speak, <coughs> as, uh, as in affecting us, and we're not really sure how that's going to happen or right. how it's going to affect us yet. Um, let's see. One other thing we wanted to mention tonight, just because we did, I'm going to go back over here just one more again. Um, and we're just to mention the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So when we, we just talked about how they can influence monetary policy and when they so they can move that rate um, that we just talked about, the federal funds rate at the very end of the short end of the yield curve, if you will, um, or they can actually purchase um, and or they can actually purchase uh, securities, fixed income securities. Uh, which is technically what or, or typically what they have done in the past um, to build up a position on their own balance sheet. So they actually own a bunch of assets and those assets are fixed income securities. Right. So a lot of a lot of the times they're treasuries. I know they did some stuff recently because of covid that they hadn't really done in the in the past. But nevertheless, what happened was as they entered the market to try to influence the market in, in a positive manner during COVID and trying to deal with that, they pumped all the stimulus into the, the economy and they don't actually print money and then just send it out. That's not actually how it works. They, they actually will purchase a uh, short term um, or whatever duration uh, fixed income instruments from the big banks that puts money into the system. And then that gets multiplied out and there's all this other, stuff that happens after that but that's how th that's how they do it and essentially by them doing that they uh acquired accumulated over time a large position of these fixed income assets right? large i like that yeah. it's large it's can, like nine trillion you, dollars yeah, i was gonna say can you say nine trillion that's pretty large well and the <laughs> and the last time they did this the last time they had to to stop doing that and then and start offloading if you will which just means they're they're going to start reducing that number and, and, and instead of reinvesting those maturities of those instruments when they come due to keep that number afloat, they're literally going to start stop doing that and let the number go down, okay, which uh, can affect the supply and the fixed income markets and all this other kind of stuff. But the, the point is the last time they did this, I think it was at four and a half trillion. Okay, so this is double, double that. Yeah. that. Um, you know, that's also known as quantitative easing, and they did this. Which Back is a fancy word for yes, um, putting money in the economy through the means right, that I just stimulus. mentioned. Stimulus. It's yeah. a, it's another means of stimulus for for a long time. One of the only tools, well, the only tool they had was to lower interest rates to zero, the Fed funds rate to zero, and and they did that back in 08 too when the, during the financial crisis. But they figured out real quick that hey, that's not enough, and so they they went on this new idea. At the time, it was brand new, quantitative easing, and they started buying those securities, put them on their balance sheet, and as the investments came due, they would reinvest it, and they kept that money in the economy. But now, right. they're, they've got a humongous balance sheet, $9 trillion, and there's some questions about when they're going to start reducing that because right now— Because their intention is to reduce yes, it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're not just going to just keep it. For yeah. all eternity. That's no. not that's not <laughs> how it works. No, they they need they need to give themselves some wiggle room for the next crisis, and who knows what that that's going to be. But um, you know, they're they're really thinking about reducing that size of that balance sheet, and what they do and how they do it 
is really important for all of us. Um, I think you're right. That's kind of the point that um, you and I have kind of been discussing is that, you know, maybe one of their levers that they have to influence the the economy is is moving the rates like we're talking about, but also maybe this offloading of the balance sheet and the decisions around when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, could also be another um, lever, if you will, um, that influences the economy on the, on through through their monetary policy because sure. that's essentially what that is even though it's not a formal lever that we're known to uh that they're known to use to influence monetary policy it doesn't mean that it's not a player this time around right right yeah um all right so um i would i would encourage you guys if, if you do have questions about any of this gilbert and i talk about this every day we love talking about this um, we just, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We would love to talk your ear off about it. If you have questions about how this stuff works, um, how it affects you personally, um, give us a call. And, and it does affect you whether you think it does or doesn't. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, yeah. Jay Powell is an important person in your life, whether you recognize that or not. I think that's what Gilbert's <laughs> said previously. Absolutely. He is. He's, um, he's your partner in everything you do. <laughs> he's like Uncle Sam, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and. This is a fine time to talk about that because you know, we're getting up into April and uh, I've been talking to several clients and they're having to write big checks to Uncle Sam for income taxes and what have you. And if that right there isn't a fine example of him being your partner in everything you do, I don't know what is. Um, and even yeah. if you're getting a refund, guess what? Guess who you're getting your refund, refund from? Yeah. It's Uncle Sam. He won't forget that. No, no. He'll put his arm around you at some point <laughs> later and he'll say, hey, remember that, uh, the, the remember that is, money I gave you? Yeah, the problem is he doesn't even kiss you or uh, take you out to dinner no, first. No, he doesn't. <laughs> it's just straight business. Um, but, hey. yeah, so so just, you know, I would encourage you all to, if if you have questions about any of this stuff, please reach out to us. Yeah, we got a um, website, uh, yeah. Texas Hill Country Advisors Hi, over here. Dot, dot com. Uh, you can call us. Uh, come by our office. We're at 222 Sydney Baker Street South. In um, the Kerrville Tower, at Suite 527. And, fifth floor. Uh, wh yeah, fifth floor. And, and before we sign off, I suppose we're getting ready to sign off quick. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I wanted to mention a couple of things. I've been asked the past couple of weeks about yeah. what are the what are the things to be looking at right now due to this geopolitical problem that we're having. And um, r real quickly, I'll, I'll suggest looking at maybe energy companies as oil prices go up energy companies tend to benefit and if you look at some of the big energy companies out there like uh, chevron exxon uh, marathon petroleum um, some of those companies like that those stocks have done really really well and yeah. they might be a good hedge against you know these higher oil prices for you know the next few months the problem is as quickly as they went up they can go down so you got to be very very careful and mindful of that the other thing, too, is uh, commodities might be worthwhile to consider. Oil, um, I'm sorry, uh, not just oil, but um, silver and gold prices have been going up a sure. little bit. I've heard, a, I've heard a lot about gold across yeah. 2,000 an ounce, I think. That's does another safe haven kind of play, right? Tends to be, tends to be. And, and does that mean you need to dump everything you've got and go into gold and silver? No, absolutely not. It just might be a good idea to maybe consider an allocation or, or yeah. a slightly bigger allocation there because there, again, as quickly as they go up, they can go down. Yeah. Hence, See. hence the word "might," which means if you if you think you know if you like those ideas, then um, you know contact us and we can we can tell you whether or not that would possibly make sense for you. Right, right. Yeah, we can we can talk about your specific situation and uh, it, it it's just something to keep you staying alive. Staying alive. Staying alive to fight another day, just so that you can you can be um, comfortable with where things are at. Uh, the the other thing to consider right now is cash. Cash is not a bad thing. When sure. the uh, economy's going crazy and markets going all over the place, cash is not a bad thing. Keep keep some cash. It's it's good um, because at some point this will turn around. Now, when's that going to be? I have no idea. Six months, six right. weeks, six hours, six years. But it will settle down, and it'll come back. And and having cash right now is not a bad thing because there's a lot of good stuff on sale right now. Probably not the day to deploy it tomorrow or, or the day after, but over the next few months, it might be a good idea to dip your toe back into the water and add to some positions. Sure. I like it. I like it. Good stuff. Hopefully that hit home with some of y'all out there because I know that, um, I mean, it hits home with me because I get to see both sides of the equation. 
right? Yes, um, yes. and Because and we're technically both clients of ourselves. Absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, people are making contributions to their IRAs, uh, yep. you know, during this time of the year because of tax season. Um, might be a good idea to make a contribution to your IRA if you haven't yet already or you haven't maxed it out. Try to max it out. Leave it there for a little while. Be patient. Be yeah. patient. Those that are patient and have some, uh, they, they are frequently rewarded right. in the long term. Shout out to the long term. Amen. Amen. Shout long out term, to brother. The long term. <laughs> go long for the long term. There you go. That's what's up. Um, all right. Thank you guys for uh, being here, for listening to us. Hopefully, we said something that was interesting or educational. You ran a, ran a little long today. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you next week. We will have the CPI number already out, so we'll know what that is and we'll have some market reaction stuff to report off of that as well. Um, and then we'll be getting ready for Jay Powell, our yes. boy Young, Young Powell, speaking next uh, Wednesday along with the interest rate decision. Next so. Wednesday, 115. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Good evening, good night, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.